We're going to talk about a subject that we frequently don't talk about in our culture today. And that's the topic of friendship. Uh, it's an interesting category of relationship. It, it's something that all of us participate in. Um, most people will say they, they at least have a friend. Um, and yet when you ask the question, um, how many times have you uh, read a book about friendship, um, taken a class on friendship, heard a lecture on friendship, heard a song on friendship? I mean, yeah, there's one or two. But compared to the 50 billion love songs in this world, it's almost like friendship doesn't exist compared to romantic love. It was very different in the ancient world, and that's where I want to start. I want to get a little sense about the, the history of friendship, how it was viewed in the ancient world. That will include both, um, for our purposes today, the Bible. Uh, what does the Bible have to say about friendship? But also, what is the the Greco-Roman world, uh, how did they view friendship? Because that, of course, is the world context within which Jesus began to teach and preach and in which early Christianity arose. We'll kind of trace um, how friendship fared up through the 19th century in our context of North America um, and then contrast that with, with what's happening with friendship today. So a little bit on the history of friendship. It's interesting, as, you, as we look back to ancient sources, Plato, um, Aristotle, uh, Cicero, some of, the, some of the great thinkers of the ancient world, what we notice is they taught quite a bit about friendship. And it almost sounds like they think friendship is the highest form of love. In our cultural context, uh, if you put, say, romantic love and friendship love next to each other, in terms of which is most important. Clearly, with regard to how many songs are written, how many movies are produced, how much energy and time people put into either pursuing friendships or pursuing romance, clearly romance wins out. Um, for example, uh, you might see two people. Uh, say uh, you see a man and a woman talking, and a, a question that might, might be posed to them are, um, are you dating or are you just friends? Do you notice how our language even betrays the fact that we see friendship as less than something like romance, right? Uh, are you dating or are you just friends? Would never say, are you friends or are you just dating? Because no, for us in our culture, romance is, well, let's be honest, romance has become an idol. And friendship, eh, it's somewhere below that. The interesting thing is in the ancient world, those two things were flipped. At least for a lot of our sources we can look at, it's clear. They valued friendship uh, above romance. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. Again, his book, The Four Loves. To the ancient people, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all of the loves the crown of life, and the school of virtue. By comparison, our modern world largely ignores it. So true. Lewis, Lewis hits the nail on the head. In the ancient world, friendship was something supremely valued. In our cultural context, sure, we all want friends, but we sort of assume that'll happen. It's things like romance that we really put our energies into pursuing. Let's begin by reflecting on a question. What have you found to be some of the challenges in both finding, or if you found, maintaining friendships in our culture? Um, what are some of the difficulties of finding a good friend or holding on to that friend over time in our context today? even in our church context? I think that's a question that we need to wrestle with. Um, again, let's look back to the ancient world and we'll start with scripture to see what it has to say about this beautiful thing called friendship. Just a few biblical teachings on, on friendship. Um, I'll draw two from the Proverbs and then one from the teachings of Jesus. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, 
A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born to share adversity. Now, interesting that this proverb connects friendship and brotherhood, or sibling relationships, right? We've talked about the fact that what covenant does is covenant produces familyed relationships where there was no family. Covenant creates family. And so in this proverb, it's comparing a friend to a brother. That's right, because in covenant friendships, brotherhood, covenant brotherhood is born. We're going to talk about a subject that we frequently don't talk about in our culture today. And that's the topic of friendship. Uh, it's an interesting category of relationship. It, it's something that all of us participate in. Um, most people will say they, they at least have a friend. Um, and yet when you ask the question, um, how many times have you uh, read a book about friendship? Um, taken a class on friendship? Heard a lecture on friendship? Heard a song on friendship? I mean, yeah, there's one or two. But compared to the 50 billion love songs in this world, it's almost like friendship doesn't exist compared to romantic love. It was very different in the ancient world, and that's where I want to start. I want to get a little sense about the, the history of friendship, how it was viewed in the ancient world. That will include both, um, for our purposes today, the Bible. Uh, what does the Bible have to say about friendship? But also, what is the the Greco-Roman world, uh, how did they view friendship? Because that, of course, is the world context within which Jesus began to teach and preach and in which early Christianity arose. We'll kind of trace um, how friendship fared up through the 19th century in our context of North America um, and then contrast that with, with what's happening with friendship today. So a little bit on the history of friendship. It's interesting, as, you, as we look back to ancient sources, Plato, um, Aristotle, uh, Cicero, some of, the, some of the great thinkers of the ancient world, what we notice is they taught quite a bit about friendship. And it almost sounds like they think friendship is the highest form of love. In our cultural context, uh, if you put, say, romantic love and friendship love next to each other, in terms of which is most important, clearly, with regard to how many songs are written, how many movies are produced, how much energy and time people put into either pursuing friendships or pursuing romance, clearly romance wins out. Um, for example, uh, you might see two people, uh, say uh, you see a man and a woman talking, and a, a question that might, might be posed to them are, um, are you dating or are you just friends? Do you notice how our language even betrays the fact that we see friendship as less than something like romance, right? Uh, are you dating or are you just friends? would never say, are you friends or are you just dating? Because no, for us in our culture, romance is, well, let's be honest, romance has become an idol. And friendship, eh, it's somewhere below that. The interesting thing is in the ancient world, those two things were flipped. At least for a lot of our sources we can look at, it's clear. They valued friendship uh, above romance. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. Again, his book, The Four Loves. To the ancient people, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all of the loves the crown of life, and the school of virtue. By comparison, our modern world largely ignores it. So true. Lewis, Lewis hits the nail on the head. In the ancient world, friendship was something supremely valued. In our cultural context, sure, we all want friends, but we sort of assume that'll happen. It's things like romance that we really put our energies into pursuing. Let's begin by reflecting on a question. What have you found to be some of the challenges in both finding or if 
you found maintaining friendships in our culture. Um, what are some of the difficulties of finding a good friend or holding on to that friend over time in our context today, even in our church context? I think that's a question that we need to wrestle with. Um, again, let's look back to the ancient world and we'll start with scripture to see what it has to say about this beautiful thing called friendship. Just a few biblical teachings on, on friendship. Um, I'll draw two from the Proverbs and then one from the teachings of Jesus. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 says this, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born to share adversity. Now, interesting that this proverb connects friendship and brotherhood, or sibling relationships, right? We've talked about the fact that what covenant does is covenant produces familyed relationships where there was no family. Covenant creates family. And so in this proverb, it's comparing a friend to a brother. That's right, because in covenant friendships, brotherhood, covenant brotherhood is born. Our next proverb comes from Proverb chapter 18, verse 24. This verse says, A man of many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Okay, this is interesting, because this, this teaching here is going to challenge our general sense of things about friendship in our, our culture. In a culture in which you often get people competing for how many Facebook friends they have, this text is saying, do the opposite. A man of many friends comes to ruin, but there is a kind of friend who sticks closer than a brother. Two things here. One, apparently, according to this proverb, the fewer friends, the better, not the more. We'll eventually come back to that principle and ask, why does the Proverbs think that's the case? But then, the kind of friend of which one wants a few is, again, called a brother. That, that covenantal kind of relationship one can have where a friend actually becomes like family. Finally, in terms of some scriptural teaching here, we'll look at John chapter 15. One of the words of Jesus on friendship. Now, in this part of John, uh, it's in those chapters where Jesus is having his final dialogue with his disciples. Literally, in a couple of, of chapters, Jesus is going to be going to the cross here. This is the last, the last evening. They've just had the Last Supper, and they're, they're having a final conversation before the crucifixion. And in the course of that conversation, Jesus says this to his disciples. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for a friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So Jesus now, he's been talking about love, now he's shifting to expressing the kind of love he wants to see amongst his disciples in the terms of friendship. You are my friends, Jesus said, if you do what I command you. Then he goes on and says this, I no longer call you servants, now I call you my friends. For a, fr a servant does not know what their master is going to do, but I call you friends because I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my Father. This is a crucial moment in Jesus' ministry when he looks at the men who he's been leading as, as followers and, and disciples, and he says to them, yeah, certainly you're, you're my disciples, but I don't treat you like servants. I treat you like friends. For everything the Father's revealed to me, I've shared with you. Jesus has brought them into the inside of his life. He's, he's shared intimately with them. He calls them friends, and then he calls us to share in friendship, covenant friendship uh, with others, uh, covenant relationship as one body, us held together as brothers and sisters through that covenant blood of the New Testament. Now, the Bible not only teaches about friendship, it also models it in some very powerful examples. Certainly Jesus calling his disciples friends here is one of those models. But probably the two most famous ones in the Old Testament are Ruth and Naomi, the, the beautiful friendship there in the book of Ruth, 
And then the powerful friendship modeled by David and Jonathan. Ruth and Naomi, a beautiful moment where a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law find themselves in a situation where the, the, the son, who's been their connection, has, has died. And yet, even though Ruth is not an Israelite, at one point in the text, in Ruth chapter 1, she says words to her mother-in-law, Naomi, that sound very much like the making of a covenant and a promise to be family and really uh, covenantal friends, despite the fact that she's no longer married to Naomi's son. The way Ruth puts it is this. Now, Naomi's just encouraged her to go back to your people. You know, my son's no longer here. I just release you to go back to your people. She's not an Israelite. Ruth says to Naomi, no. Here's her words. Do not tell me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. There too will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more if even death parts me from you. Powerful expression of a covenant vow of promise to remain uh, covenant friends even though the family connection has been lost due to the death of a son. <clears throat> David and Jonathan. Um, probably no single friendship in Western history has so profoundly affected the vision of deep friendship than the friendship of David and Jonathan. This is described in 1 Samuel chapters 18, chapter 20. But this is a text uh, describing the making of the covenant. They actually bound themselves together in covenant friendship because of the deep commitment they had to each other. The text says this, this from 1 Samuel 18 verses 1 to 4. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of his robes he was wearing and he gave it to David as well as his sword, his armor, his bow, and his belt. Now what we have in this, in this short passage is just a, a part of the description of the covenant ceremony in which David and Jonathan became covenant brothers. Remember we talked long ago about the fact that in a covenant ceremony there's always going to be a moment where there's an exchange of something to show unity, uh, common identity. And one of the things that could be exchanged was clothing and armor. We see this very ritual happening between David and Jonathan where they exchange clothing, they exchange their armor, their swords, their bows, their belt. Their very own possessions they give to the other such that they're really saying, I've become you and you've become me. It's like we've become one soul knit together. Covenant brothers where there was no family before and now there's family. It's not just the Bible that we see this high value placed on friendship and even the making of covenants around friendship. In the wider Greco-Roman world, in which eventually Jesus will be born into and his ministry flourish, we see the same value put on friendship. Just a few quotes from some leading thinkers in the ancient Roman world. Cicero, a, uh, a well-known thinker in, in the ancient Roman context, he says this, We need friendship all the time, just as much as we need the proverbial prime necessities of life water and fire. So Cicero takes friendship and elevates it to the point of fire and water, the very necessities by which humans are able to live. In another place, Cicero says this, the bonds which nurture, let me start that again. In another context, Cicero says this, the bonds which nature has established to link one member of the human race with another are innumerable. Okay, a lot of ways we can be connected to other humans. But, he says, friendship not only surpasses all of them, but is something so choice, so selective, 
that its manifestations are normally restricted to two persons and two persons only or at most extremely few. Now this gets us back to that biblical teaching in Proverbs that a man of many friends comes to ruin but there's a kind of friend who sticks closer to than a brother. Cicero is picking on, up on the same ancient wisdom that you don't want lots of friends you want a few friends that are dependable. Cicero is saying the kind of thing that real friendship is you only have the resources the kind of time and personal investment capabilities to be able to pour into two or maybe at the most a few more. But real friendship demands that level of time and commitment. Finally, Cicero says about friendship that it is the most valuable of all human possessions. Now, what we notice here is again, in the ancient world, it's not romance. It is friendship that takes the supreme and choice place amongst human relationships. Seneca, um, another Roman philosopher and a statesman, says this. He says, to lose a friend is the greatest of all evils. Of all, of all the evil things he can imagine happening, losing a friend, he says, is at the top of the list. Aristotle, similarly, has some powerful things to say about friendship. He says, the antidote to 50 enemies is one friend. He also goes on to say that wishing to be friends is quick work, but friendship itself is a slowly ripening fruit. One can want to be friends real quickly, but to actually become that friend, to maintain that friendship, to work through the conflicts that any friendship brings, that's a, that is a long journey, a slowly ripening fruit. Maybe more than anyone else in the ancient world, Aristotle is known for writing about friendship, for kind of analyzing it and getting to the, to the core of what it's really about. Aristotle eventually said that friendship, and let's be clear here, for Aristotle what this meant was two males in friendship. This was a largely sexist culture. And uh, it was seen to be the case that men's friendships were more important than women's friendships. We would certainly say from a kingdom perspective that it's not just male friendships. It's, it's any deep friendships. But the way Aristotle analyzed friendship is he said, there's three parts to a strong friendship. Three things that, um, that friendships are uh, composed of and revolve around. The first is enjoyment. Aristotle says you have to enjoy each other's company. There's, there's got to be a, uh, an enjoyable dimension. One, one appreciates and, and likes being around each other. But that's only the first of three. Secondly, he says there has to be usefulness to each other. In other words, uh, real friends will meet each other's needs. We come to need each other, and friends will be there for that. Now, in our culture, often that's all you need for a friendship is you enjoy each other and you, you help each other out. But Aristotle says, if that's all you have to a friendship, that is a very unstable friendship. For a very simple reason, Aristotle says. Our enjoyments, what we like or don't like, can change, and our needs can change. Therefore, if our friendships are based simply on what we enjoy and what we need, and our enjoyments and needs can change, our friendships are always unstable. They might go away if we don't enjoy that person any longer or need them. So Aristotle says a third component is absolutely necessary for a, f a strong, stable friendship. And that is, he said, a mutual commitment to what he called the good. And when Aristotle says the good, he's basically saying what he means by God. So for Aristotle, what really stabilized a friendship was a mutual commitment to God or the good. In other words, to grow together in virtue cultivating the virtues of, of the, uh, the life that's oriented towards that which is good and beautiful, towards God. This vision of friendship, both grounded in the biblical texts and emphasized by some of the Greek philosophers, um, continued to deeply influence for centuries 
the, the Western tradition on friendship. What you see from the biblical times, from David and Jonathan, through Aristotle and, and Plato and those folks, right up through the many centuries of Western history, is you see this ongoing sense that friendship is a valuable, valuable relationship that takes time and work and that must be put as a priority in one's life. What you also see is a real understanding that intimate, same-sex friendships are core, a core need, uh, a core part of the beauty of human relationship. We see this really as a cross-cultural phenomenon around the world, that, that, that strong same-sex friendships have always been part of the fabric of human life. Um, in the Western tradition, they're, they're often uh, grounded in the, the, the images we get in Scripture. So David and Jonathan, for example, become a primary model for centuries in the Western tradition for what real brother-to-brother uh, -brother friendship should look like. Brothers around covenant or brothers around committed friendship, not just siblings in the flesh. In the classic tradition of Rome and Greece, the same thing comes out of Aristotle's teachings. Um, we see this, for example, in an interesting ritual that's developed in medieval Christianity, particularly in Eastern Christianity. It was called the Alpha. Alpha uh, let me restart that. <clears throat> One very interesting tradition that arose in Eastern Christianity was called the Adelphopoesis ritual. Now, Adelphos means brother. Poesis means to make. So literally, this ritual is to make a brother. And what it was was a covenant ceremony that would happen um, in which the people would be prayed for. They would commit each other to themselves to each other in friendship through vows. And this tradition goes way back into the Middle Ages. It's still being practiced today in certain sectors of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. But this is just one example where Christian tradition took the model of David and Jonathan, the powerful teachings about friendship by Jesus, and began to live them out, actually making covenants with each other that would connect them in powerful, committed ways on into the future. There's four basic characteristics that we can see in these deep same-sex friendships that extend for centuries. First, whether there's an actual covenant ceremony or not, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Um, in either case, these deep friendships often use the language of siblings to express what they are to each other. And so the language of, of brothers, if the, it's two men or sisters, if it's uh, two women, is very common. Now, again, sometimes this brother-sister language actually arises out of the making of a covenant, an actual ceremony. <clears throat> but sometimes, as in our culture today, where we'll often call a, a close friend, uh, hey, brother, or hey, bro, uh, or a sisterhood, that same language was used all through these centuries to express that friendship can be just as powerful, deep, and committed as a blood family relationship. Secondly, in this tradition, this, this long tradition of, of close, intimate friendship, one of the chief considerations, one of the things that, that the, the friends appreciated most about each other was their character. There was a focus on the character of each other, the, the virtue, um, how each other was expressing the, the profound uh, Christ-like uh, um, uh, attributes of humility, of honesty, of trustworthiness. It was one's character, not their personality, not how funny they were, or uh, you know whether they um, were, were good at uh, building things that could help you out when you needed a home project. I mean, again, enjoyment and helping each other were part of this. But as Aristotle said, so the Christians said, it's actually the pursuit of God and that growing together. In a Christian context, they would say, growing into Christ's likeness together. That's the core of the friendship. That's what they appreciate most about each other. That's what they celebrate. 
is the fact that our friendship is helping us be formed into the image of Jesus. Now, a third element in this, and this is one that's going to be a bit countercultural to us in the West, is that these same sex friendships would be quite demonstrable, quite expressive in terms of their affection for each other. Um, we have record, uh, in fact, up to almost the beginning of the 20th century in the West, for example, photographs of men who are friends uh, sitting, posing for the picture, holding hands together. Or in some cases, even one, one man sitting on the other's lap. In other words, the kind of things, the kind of expression of affection that today in our culture, we usually only associate with romantic sorts of things. But for most of Western history, holding hands, uh, expressing very profound, intimate feelings for each other, that was part of friendship. We have letters exchanged uh, up into the 18th and 19th centuries by, uh, by friends, say two men, who will, I, there was one letter written by a guy to his friend. He's saying, uh, your letters to me are like a basket full of kisses. But it's clear in the context of their friendship that there was no erotic element. There was no sexualization there. They were just expressing how profoundly deep and meaningful they were to each other simply in the context of what we would call filial love, not, that, not, not erotic love. And that's a, a, a confusion that in our culture we often, often mistake here. Lots of deep, intimate affection, uh, but without sexualizing it. Something that, uh, that our culture challenges with, uh, is, is challenged with. Now what happened to this kind of friendship? Well, historians who study friendship through history have said that something began to happen in the late um, 1900s on into the, to the early 20th century. Uh, so late 19th century, let me start that again. So what's happened to this kind of deep same-sex friendship in our culture? Well, historians of friendship tell us that somewhere around the late 19th into the early 20th century, a significant change began to happen in the nature of friendship. One of the first things they notice is that masculinity, how, how, how men, real men, how masculinity began to be um, defined and described is that it began to be associated with less emotion, with, with more, uh, more logic and less feeling. And as that began to happen, therefore, men's friendships began to be seen as something you shouldn't be emotional about, but just simply be rational about. And so it began to sort of really gut male friendships of this deep emotional component to profound friendship. Add to that that while masculinity is being defined as, as simply emotionless, at the same time, Modern sexuality studies, culminating particularly in Freud, in his work in the early 20th century, Freud started hypersexualizing everything. He's finding sexual motivation behind uh, everything from infancy up through the human life cycle. This now starts to affect male friendships as people become concerned that perhaps their intimacy is actually a sexualization sort of thing. And now you've got the development of homophobia, where people are afraid to express same-sex affection because it might label them with this new label that's developed in the late 1900s, uh, late 19th century, of homosexual. This begins to increasingly um, rule out deep, expressive relationships between men particularly, but even between women that starts to affect to some degree as well. Add to this finally the rise of what some have called muscular Christianity. This notion that to be not just a real man, but a real manly Christian, one has to be tough, one has to be a certain kind of masculinity. <clears throat> and now, even in Christian circles, deep, intimate, expressive male friendships are something that are avoided in order to put on the face of a real man, masculinity. One uh, well-known American pastor not too long ago 
expressed this kind of muscular Christianity when he said this. <clears throat> In the book of Revelation, he says, Jesus is a pride fighter with a tattoo down his leg, a sword in his hand, and a commitment to make someone bleed. That's a guy I can worship. I cannot worship the hippie diaper halo Christ because I can't worship a guy that I can beat up. If that's your vision of true masculinity, you can't worship a guy you can beat up, well then it's going to be pretty difficult um, finding yourself able to enter into vulnerable, emotion-filled, expressive relationships with other men when your sense of masculinity is being able to beat someone up. Um, this is the kind of thing that's affected not only our culture, therefore, but the church itself, to rob us of deep same-sex friendships. What's this brought us to? Well, there's been a couple of polls taken the last number of years that have shown just how desperate we've become for deep, meaningful friendships. In a 2008 Barna poll, it turned out that while 74% of American adults said that having close personal friends was one of their top agendas in life, it turns out that 40% of those people say that they still are looking for, quote, a few close friends. Three, three quarters of people that's on their list Close friends, 40% of them still looking. In another study on friendship in America, it turns out that American males, adults, male adults in America, reported having the fewest friends. Reminds me of a book written not too many years ago called The Friendless American Male. That is exactly what uh, is reported in studies. Men desperate for deep friendships. Turns out, this study says, that when men get together, they're more likely to do stuff together than to have deep conversations together. Again, the study showed that male friendships tend to provide less emotional support than other sorts of friendships in our culture. In other words, female friends do tend to provide emotional support for each other. Male-female, so cross-gender friendships, they do too. But you put two men together, and frequently the emotional dimension is not something that's touched on. Finally, the study showed that when men do find a close friend, for three quarters of them, it's not another male. They find that in the female uh, gender, either a wife or a female friend or something along those lines. In other words, the friendless American male, that book that was written a few years back, documents quite well in its title the report of many men in our culture that deep, committed, same-sex friendships is something that's very elusive and yet something that by the vision of the New Testament, Jesus' own use of this idea of friendship, all the way back to the Proverbs, that this is something we are wired for and designed for. We're going to take a look at exactly what covenant friendship is and how we can begin to move into it in more intentional ways.